This is Channel 5, KTLA, Los Angeles. Channel 5 presents Movies Till Dawn for your late night entertainment. Tonight, The Deadly Mantis, starring Craig Stevens and William Hoper. Welcome to Movies Till Dawn, a new podcast that's a safe space for filmmakers to talk about the fascinating and exasperating and always unusual and never quite the same thing twice process of creating motion pictures. I'm Raymond DeFelita, and currently I'm accepting all job offers. So here's part two of uh, my conversation with my friend Peter Bogdanovich uh, that we did a couple of years ago in the basement of Brett Ratner's house. Uh, <clears throat> if you want a further explanation of that, go back to part one, and I'll, uh, it'll all will become clear. Uh, in this, we largely talk about Orson Welles, a, a major, you know, force in Peter's life, uh, and of course a major force in anyone who loves movies' life. Um, you know, he, he. I want to read you a quick quote from uh, the book of conversations that Peter had with Orson Welles. It's a wonderful book. It's called This Is Orson Welles. Uh, it, it's really like you're sitting around a, a long and lovely dinner with the two of them, a, a very long, lovely dinner because the book's of 300 pages. Uh, the, the thing that I find so interesting about this, though, is that Wells talks about meeting Sarah Bernhardt and the effect it had on him, and it very much makes me feel about the way I've always felt about Peter uh, and, and what happened when I met him. Wells is telling Peter uh, about how he was taken to the theater a lot uh, as a kid, and he says, quote, This hand that touches you now once touched the hand of Sarah Bernhardt. Can you imagine that? She had a wooden leg, and she was playing vaudeville, and I was brought backstage. I was four or five years old, I guess. I was led into a bower of dark red roses where that marvelous old lady sat in her wheelchair, refreshing herself from a tank of oxygen. That hand I took was a claw covered with liver spots and liquid white, and with the pointy ends of her sleeves glued over the back of it. When she was young, Mademoiselle Bernhardt had taken the hand of Madame George, who had been the mistress of Napoleon. Peter, just three handshakes from Napoleon. It's not that the world is so small, but that history is so short. And when I met Peter, I realized that I was only one handshake away from John Ford and Howard Hawks, Stella Adler, uh, and Orson Welles himself. So here's part two of my conversation with Peter Bogdanovich. <laughs> I asked Orson once about. I said, "What do you think is the, what do you think is the difference between a scene that's done in one shot and a scene that's cut up? Do you think there's an essential difference?" And Orson said, "Well, we used to say that's what separated the men from the boys." And and yet, when he does one take scenes, they're not necessarily invisible as one take scenes. He puts a lot of there's a lot of pizzazz going on in his one take. Sometimes. But other times, like for example, everybody talks about the opening shot in Touch of Evil. Mm. But there's another shot in Touch of Evil, which is actually more complicated in a certain way. Uh, it's in the um, motel room where the, the the daughter of the guy that got blown up is living with that Mexican guy. Right. And there's, it's all one shot when, the, what's his name, um, Heston sees that the box is empty. Right. All in one shot. And then in, it continues, and the guy comes up and says, oh, I found dynamite. I just was there. It was empty. Well, we know you try to protect him and so on. That whole scene is one shot from when Orson walks in. Only the offbeat, original, creative powers of Orson Welles could bring you so suspenseful, so gripping, so different a drama of love threatened by vengeance. Mike may be spoiling some of your friends. Mike? My husband, yeah. Of a struggle between titans. You framed that boy. Framed him! And as I recall, it moves through through a couple of different rooms. Yes, it does, and, and pans down to the bathtub because the box falls in there. It's a complicated shot. So he has walls flying away as the camera's uh, moving have, in and out, right? Have, yeah. I love Jimmy Stewart talking about, talking about walls moving. I remember Jimmy Stewart was telling me about shooting rope with Hitchcock where they the whole thing was, they did like eight shots, all one shot or something. Right. Long takes, which Hitchcock never did before, but he did that on rope. 
and a lot on under Capricorn. Jimmy's description of it was hilarious because he'd say, you'd come over here and you'd put a cigarette out over there and then you'd walk away and come back and the, the cigarette was gone, the ashtray was gone, the table was gone, and the wall was gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that was funny. I got, I got, can you stop a second? Yeah, of course, yeah. I have this drink that I drink lunch often called the green machine yeah and it, it, i call it the revenge of the green machine because it takes a couple hours or three hours to get through you but once it's through you have to pee a lot is that the point of it no it's like it just, a, di a diuretic it, or... no it just it happens mm. it's a nuisance actually i had a uh, i know a little bit about how you met orson I've always thought of all the I, I've, I've met a, I've met a plenty of famous people. I've never been nervous about meeting any of them. Had I ever met him, I think I would have been terrified, and I don't know why. <laughs> well, I, I can I know what you mean. I was so scared to meet him that I drove in low, all the way up the fucking hill in the in the shift car, and the thing overheated. And... Did you subconsciously not want to get there? Or? I no, I just I can't imagine why I was driving in low the whole time. Probably terrified. But here's the thing that's interesting. We met at the Polo Lounge uh, at the Beverly Hills Hotel. He was so disarming. I mean, he was so disarming that, that really after an hour, I felt I'd known him for years. It was, it was amazing. He had that ability to be very intimate quickly and sort of with you quickly. He got past all the stuff, all the bullshit, polite stuff. He just did, didn't deal with that at all. He mm. just went right into it. Do you think he could he could smell who was worth doing that with? Did he just I, kind I of get know. it early with you? I don't know. I just don't know. Um, he liked me, and he liked Ford. He loved John Ford was his favorite director, and I had just written this book about Ford, which I gave him a copy. I brought him a copy of the right. John Ford book, which he liked to have. Well, I'll tell you a funny thing about it. He was so disarming that after an hour, I actually had the balls to tell him to say, there's only one film of yours I don't really like. Which one? The Trial. I don't either. And they said, we have here a list of movies we are ready to finance. You pick up the, out the one you like. They didn't say, what do you want to make? They said, here is our list. And I said, I couldn't add to this list any. No, they said, here they are. And there were about 82 titles, most of which were impossible. And the most likely of which was the trial. So I said, we'll do the trial. So we made the trial. And I know that kind of answer it's very disappointing because you want to think of a filmmaker as having studied in his library the work which sings the most perfect song to him and uh, that I had spent my life wanting to realize Kafka on the screen. I'd never given a thought to it. I thought, this is amazing. I thought, well, what, what extraordinary rapport I have with this man. So we, when we were leaving that day, he flipped through the book that I'd given him, the paperback, and he said, it's too bad you're a big director, now you can't do an interview book like this with me. And I said, I'd love to do one with you. He said, oh, well, let's do one. <laughs> nice little book like this about me. Nice little book about him. Well, anyway, that became that became a saga in, its, in itself. Mm. The book didn't get published until, I think it was seven years after he died or something. This is Orson Welles. Orson Welles, yeah. Which is a, it's a, a tremendous book. Book, but you really do get a sense of your rapport with him through well, it. That book is, it's, it, I always think it's like I'm, I'm sitting at the table with you two, listening to you. It's that's very nice. Yeah, it's very. Well, Orson said, let's not do it in one, let's not, let's set it all over the world and not, not do it all in one club. And let's not do it where every subject is beaten to death in chronological order. Just, let's just talk. And so the book is loose in a certain way. <laughs> I remember once. He said, "You know, put it, put it, put 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 it, put it in Paris. We were in Paris together. Put it in Rome. Put it in L.A. Put it in Guaymas, Mexico. Put it in Van Nuys, California." I said, "Orson, you never came out to Van Nuys. What possible difference does that make?" <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, there's a whole scene set in the book in Van Nuys where you show him White Heat, Is the James Van Cagney, Nuys? Raoul Walsh film, yeah. in your backyard. No, no, I showed, we showed it in his, uh, I, I, maybe I said it wrong. We actually showed it in his, in his Beverly Hills home. I brought the projector over and showed it in his house. Oh, so I misremember. But there's some scene that takes place in your backyard. Yeah, like he's is. lying on the grass. That's I right. Was, is that true? No. Could that have happened? He never was there. <laughs> That's what I mean. He just made it up. But about six months after that meeting in the Polo Lounge, about three months after, I was doing the book with him, and I said something slightly disparaging about the trial. And he said, I wish you'd stop saying that. I thought you said you didn't like the picture. No, I just said that to please you. I like it very much. In fact, it's one of my most personal films. But I, I have a great respect for your opinion. And so when you denigrate it, you diminish my small treasure. Wow. I said, Jesus Christ, Orson. I, I didn't, I don't, I don't, uh, all right, that's enough. From then on, he referred to the trial as, that picture you hate. <laughs> <laughs> and, he said, and then he says to me, you know why you don't like that picture you, you hate? I said, why? Because you didn't realize how funny it is. Tony Perkins and I were laughing all the time. So then one day he says, we were in Paris, and he says, they're showing that picture you hate on the left bank t t and the right bank today, this, this evening. Do you want to go? I said, sure, yeah, I'd love to go. Fine. What's the occasion? He said, they're giving me an award and a check. What's the check for? For the take it for accepting the award. <laughs> I said, they're paying you to accept an award? He said, of course, you don't think I accept an award without being paid for it, do you? So we went, and sure enough, Jean Moreau presented him with an award. And I saw her hand him an envelope put in his pocket. And uh, then I sat next to him during the whole movie. And he starts chuckling. And when he was picking up his cue, I, I see what he thought was funny. And I thought it was kind of funny, too. Because mm. uh, I, I get it. So I started chuckling, too. And the people in the sitting in the theater, shh. Orson. <laughs> telling Orson and me to shut up. Right. You can't laugh at a Kafka Wells movie. That was the misunderstanding that I get grasped once I spent uh, the, the, sitting next to him at the right bank. Then the next day he says to me, they showed it on the left bank too, and people laughed all the way through it. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it, it, um, it's interesting because you don't think of Wells as funny ever. You don't think of him as, as and comic. And he was funny. But he, is, he certainly comes off that way in your, in your interviews with him. Yeah, he's very funny and very on top of it, you know. Mm. He says kind of a, there's an extraordinary moment where he tells you how unimportant the director is to a film. Yeah. His whole, his whole theory is, and he says, uh, a good film will get itself made without a director. Well, was I'm he goading quite. you with this? What was he doing with, with that kind uh, of... He thought that it was... He, his point was that it was an overrated job, that there is somebody on the set who can tell you where to put the cam camera. That's the cameraman. There's somebody on the set who can edit, the editor. Somebody on the set to give you the costumes, sets, everything. There's somebody for every department. What does the director do? I said, well, you, you, surely you don't mean people like Renoir or Lubitsch. Or, he said, no, 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 no. At the highest levels, of course, the director's the man. But most pictures, the average picture, is really about the performances, and the performances are not necessarily have anything to do with the director. And I, even today, I, I talk to actors, they say, directors never talk to us. They're scared of us. But Act, I, actors don't talk to, uh, directors don't talk to actors even today they don't much but I get the sense that that wasn't who he was as a director you were an actor in his in other side of the wind for him what was he like he couldn't have been more kind to the actors he couldn't have been more fun he was fun he was delightful he was just you didn't worry about fucking up with Orson it, it, whatever happened happened he made you better than you are really because he just was so open. I don't know. He was just funny. I mean, I remember one 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 shot I had with Oya, his uh, his partner. Um, I had to run up with a rifle and say something to her, and I just I don't know. But the shot broke me up, and it broke her up. We both started laughing. I couldn't get the words out. I could just I felt so silly running up with a rifle and saying something. It just didn't seem like me, and uh, but it, it made me laugh. And I laughed, and Oya laughed, and we tried it a couple of times, and we couldn't couldn't do it. We laughed, and Orson would be laughing each time, also. And then finally, with the fifth or sixth time, 
We're getting through it. I'm not laughing. And Orson breaks up. <laughs> I, I I always get the sense, too, too, though, that because he was so loose, uh, he was getting something from actors when they weren't looking, I guess would be the way to, to think of it, that later on he would he would call things that, you know, because he apparently, I guess he shot quite a bit. Well, I only worked on the other side of the wind, so I'm not sure how he did other pictures, but he didn't shoot that much coverage. Takes well, many takes. Not that many. His pace is so uh, is so fast, and the Very, and the yeah. overlapping is so the yeah, lines he likes are all so. That. He almost doesn't have to say it. You know that's the way he wants it. I have the Green Machine Revenge coming okay. again. I'll be, I'll be, right, I'll be right back. Okey doke. There's so much written about Wells and his the obstacles that he faced in finishing whatever the five or six films that he that he didn't finish and they always strike me as both there were right reasons for for not finishing them but that there were you know they ran out of money or there were problems that got I know other side of the wing got tied up somehow with the Shaw of Iran and his fall um, but I also always wondered if he didn't want to finish some of them if he had found his way into a kind of perpetual I don't know whether it was perfectionism or maybe just fear you know I mean after all he did begin at the summit he achieved the greatest, you know, that, that could have been achieved at the very beginning. Did you ever have any feelings about that? Um, well, Orson took the position that since he was paying for most of these films that he didn't finish, and since he was a, like a painter, my father, for example, was a painter, and he worked on several paintings at the same time. And, you know, my father said a painting is never finished. Just like Robert Graves said, a poem is, is never perfect. So... I think Orson felt that way in a certain way. He felt that since he was like paying for these things himself, it was nobody's business when he would finish them or not. I think, for example, he did a picture based on a book called Dead Calm. He called it Dead Reckoning. He called it The Deep. He called it a couple of things. It's a and thriller on the on a the thriller water. on the yeah. boat, yeah. Which Philip Noyce did as Dead Calm with Nicole Kidman and had to buy the rights from Oya Kodar. Oh, for, from partner. his partner, yeah. Because he made a movie with himself, Jean Moreau, Larry Harvey, and Oya, which I've seen a good part of. It's very good. We're out in the Pacific Ocean. A newly wedded couple are here on their small yacht, cruising up the west coast of Africa on their way to the Mediterranean. Not a breath of air, so they're becalmed. To save gas, they're not using their auxiliary engine. Out in these waters, they might expect to be very much alone. But there's someone else out there. Another boat. Somebody is rowing over to them. The stranger has a very strange tale to tell. He's alone. Everyone else on that boat of his is dead. I've seen clips of, of The Deep. Yeah, it looks... I, that's another one. I've, I've wondered, though, why, why didn't well, it I get finished? I asked him about that. I said, why didn't you release that? He said, I hadn't made a picture in quite a while, and I thought it should come out with something a little weightier than just a little thriller, which was a mistake. I think. So that can be read as him saying, I, don't, I didn't think it was serious enough, or I thought exactly. that people would think that I had, I had fallen somehow in their, in their estimation as an artist. Because he had, hadn't done a picture for a while and done a little thriller. That's what he said. Mm. Well, I, I don't agree with him because if the picture would have worked, which it probably would have, it would have just made it easier for him. Mm. But he didn't think that way. Or was that a kind of a self-consciousness that had set in with him at, uh, after perhaps too much frustration? You know, I mean, I, fe I feel like Chimes at Midnight, this was a, one of his greatest films, and it mm. would, had a very thwarted distribution life. It, it Terrible. Didn't, yeah. That, that, that that had happened to him enough at that point to where well, he was gun-shy. it happened gun so much to him in his own country. People just didn't get it about Orson. He was just too much for people. And he, I don't think he was that easy in the, in the, when he started. I mean, I think he, you know, th I, don't, I don't know. I can't say for what he, what he was like. He was a complicated guy. That's sort of an obvious statement. But, you know, he just did things his own way. I think he had, he was very mercurial, hence the name of his company, The Mercury. He was very mercurial, and he got bored with things, and he'd move on. That's why he'd often leave the cutting right after he finished shooting. He'd done it. He'd seen it. He's finished as far as he was concerned. Trouble is, he had to finish it for everybody else. Yeah. I, I, I wondered about that, too. I thought, you know, because he sort of famously uh, uh, finished Touch of Evil and then 
quickly left before the studio could could get involved. And I thought he he knew that he had achieved something that was perfect in his eyes, and he knew it's only going to go downhill from here. And he didn't want to be around for that part of the the process. He 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 shunned what he knew was going to come, rather than staying and fighting it or trying to be charming or gracious and and keep it. He he just left. Yeah, I know. He did that a couple of times. He would leave. He left after Ambersons too. But I think he, he, at that point he thought that it would be they'd just do what he wanted, and cut it the way he wanted. He didn't. It hadn't happened to him yet. What happened on Ambersons? Right. Which was one of the biggest tragedies in the history of American film. That that picture was particularly that picture, which was a, a, a masterpiece. Yeah, the ending of Ambersons really does come out of left field and touch. It's an entirely different movie when you watch it. The last half hour is partially Wells and partially. Freddie Flick. <laughs> Freddie Flick. When you came to Hollywood, you were working for Esquire magazine. Did you you pitch Harold Hayes the idea of going to Hollywood and 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 being that correspondent? Was that your idea to to, to come out here and and interview these guys? No. What what happened was this. I came. I saved up enough money after I did the Big Knife off Broadway. I directed and produced the Big Knife off Broadway in the nineteen fifty nine sixty season. I was 20 and then turned 21. And I, was, I wanted to convince Clifford Odets to let me do another play, another play of his, another play of his that was not particularly well-known called Night Music. And so I saved up enough money to go to Hollywood for two weeks. And this was in 1960. I was going to see Clifford, and since I knew all the publicity guys at the various studios, I got a friend of mine, Bob Silvers, at, at the Harper's Magazine. He's the guy who... So much later started the New York Review of Books. He was I, I'd met him some of my friends, and I said, "Could you give me a letter telling me that you will you're, you're assigning me to do a piece on the state of the art in Hollywood?" He said, "No, I can't do that, but I'll give you a letter saying that I'll be happy to read anything you write." Well, that wasn't good enough, so I just lied and told everybody I was on assignment from Harper's, <laughs> and met everybody and Clifford Odets, of course, was the point, and Cary Grant and a lot of people. Hitchcock, so on. Um, and Clifford didn't agree to give me the rights. And then I wrote the piece, actually after the summer. I went away for the summer, directed four or five plays outside of New York City. And um, wrote this piece, and it was turned down by The New Yorker, by Harper's, by The Atlantic. And finally, I was invited to a screening of Hatari, Howard Hawks's Hatari. And they were also having a little dinner party afterward at New Rochelle for nobody, just the press. Mm. And I was seated at a table with a young guy with a southern accent. I, I said, who, where do you, where do you, where, who do you work for? She, he said, Esquire. And I, he mentioned some movie, and I said, that's a terrible movie. And then I mentioned the movie, he said, that's a terrible movie. And we insulted each other for about an hour. And as he was leaving, I walked, was walking with him out the door, and I said, what do you do at Esquire? He said, I'm the managing editor. I said, oh, God. So about a week later, I called him, and I said, you remember me? I'm the kid that insulted you at dinner. And he says, yeah, I remember you. What, what can I do for you? I said, well, I wrote a piece about Hollywood, and I thought maybe you'd like to read it. He said, send it over. So I sent it over, and he called me about a week, not even a week later. He said, hey, buddy, we're going to buy this piece and run it as the lead piece in our August issue, and we'd like you to go to Hollywood and on assignment and do a profile of Jerry Lewis. I said, why, why Jerry Lewis? He said, well, we like what you wrote in this piece. It was only a short couple of paragraphs, but we think you could do a hell of a piece on Jerry Lewis. So I got two pieces in one phone call, 600 bucks at each one. It was, a, it was great. And that was Harold Hayes, that the was Esquire. Harold Hayes, yeah. Esquire. He was the, the best editor that Esquire ever had, and the magazine was, at that point, the hippest magazine in the country. Sure. And it was that way until until Harold left. It seems to me that you were I picture you as the the kind of the the guy who the the gold miner who strikes gold when they're when they're not necessarily everyone else isn't yet seeing it because there you are going they're all sitting here Cary Grant Alfred Hitchcock John Ford Alan Dwan but I, and 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 you but you're the one who called them you're the one who picked up the phone you're the one who said I, I'm interested in this do you know it's like I I, I always think of you out there at, at that period as being the one who was smart enough to go I bet these guys will talk uh, well, no one's no one's that, asking them to that's uh, all yeah and I also wanted to know them and wanted to hear what they had to say I wanted to make movies who am I going to ask not a professor who were the first few that you who were the first few directors that you met well. 
Don't forget, I got the Museum of Modern Art to do a Hawks retrospective in 62, and then and got, got Paramount to pay for it, which the museum loved me for that. And then I got Universal to pay for a Hitchcock retrospective in 68, 63. So I did three retrospectives in three years. The first one was Orson. There's no studio for that. But on Paramount, Hawks, and Hitchcock, Universal, I got paid good money for like 250 a week. First money I ever got from a studio. And the funny thing is, I did the retrospectives. The, they were very popular. And I was writing for Esquire. I was doing a lot of writing. And uh, the irony of all that is that when Roger Cor- I met Roger Corman in 1965, a year after we got to California, we moved to California, uh, the first thing he brought up to me was Esquire. He said, you write for Esquire. I've read your stuff. Would you like to write for the movies? So Esquire led to the movies, mm. which I didn't think it would. And yet it seems it's interesting because even the plays you were doing before you went to, they're all movie-centric. The Big Dude, Knife. Big Knife and Once in a Lifetime. Yeah, you did Once in a Lifetime, the Kaufman yeah. and Hart Kaufman satire and yeah, right, yeah. about the early talkies. When you went to do Jerry the Jerry Lewis piece, which is what Hayes, I guess, said, you know, he, he it was his idea. Yes. What did you think of Jerry at that time? Loved him. You always did? I loved him. He was very sweet to me. Were you interested in, in him, though, as a, as a comedian, as a filmmaker? Or? Well, not so much as a filmmaker, but yes, to a degree. I mean, he, was, he was a big star at that moment. That was probably the height of his fame, because he, had, he, was, he made it. Bellboy was a big hit. He directed it. He'd been in numerous hits since Broke Up With Dean. Yeah, I loved him. I thought he was great. He was very funny. He liked me, too. It's yeah. interesting, these, these famously uh, uh, difficult uh, men who decide to, to trust you and take them under their wing, Orson Welles, John Ford, Jerry Lewis, n- none of them are, are known as angels. That's true. And yet you, you bring out the sympathy in them somehow. I don't know what it was, but I got lucky, I tell you. What was he shooting when you went to, what was Jerry Lewis? Ladies' Man. Uh, which he directed. Which he directed. Mr. Is there anything I can get for you, anything I can do for you or anything? Look, Skinny, I uh, come to see my girl. She's... I forgot to find out which one that you wanted to see, and I ran out. So. Look, stupid. No, Herbert. Stupid. Herbert. Stupid. Stupid Herbert. That's right. That's me. Yeah, it was a great set. It was like open, like one. the fourth wall was removed. Right. A bunch of rooms. He was the first to use a video assist. Yeah, I said to him, what are all those monitors doing on TV monitors? He said, oh, and he explained to me that they had a, ca- a TV camera that they'd mounted on next to the movie camera, quite close. So that he could see himself, because he was directing the picture, and he wanted to be able to see himself, either while he was doing it or right after. And he, and he was the first one to come up with that. What was, what was his set like? He, he was kidding around all the time. Yeah. He'd go up in the, in the crane and make no, and jokes, throw things down at the crew. Right. He was kind of hacking around a lot. Yeah. When you met Cary Grant, and I know that he was the star of one of your favorite films as a, as a young man, Holiday. Oh. Which you, you write very beautifully about your feelings uh, about a, a, after first seeing Holiday, which I guess you saw as obviously as a revival in the 1950s. In the 50s, yeah, 55. Cary Grant, Catherine Hepburn, directed by George Cukor. And it really the pinnacle, I think, of, uh, of, of, of sophisticated 1930s art deco comedy, really. Holiday, which wasn't popular in its day, as also wasn't bringing a baby. Holiday is a revolutionary film in a way because there's a line in it. I, I won't get it right, but somebody says, "Don't you have enough money?" He says, "Enough money to a, to a guy that's a businessman. It never can be enough money." But that's where we are now. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I th- that's a great film, Holiday. I love that film. It's, it's it makes you feel happy when it's over. It was just like it was, it was very liberating that movie. It's like he wants to just be free to think about things and not rush into things. And, Carrie's character is wonderful. But then you went to see, uh, when, when you met him in, in, in Hollywood, he had just made that touch of mink. Right. In the early 60s, and, and, and you went to a screening of it. Yeah, that was... I, 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 <laughs> I didn't know him that well yet. I got to know him better, but I knew him a little bit. And he invited us to a screening of that touch of mink. Which, and I, the greatest thing about it was sitting behind him and Diane Cannon. It's Cary Grant. In Affairs of the Heart, he's an irresistible force. And Doris Day, in Affairs of the Heart, she's an immovable object. And when they meet, wow. I didn't like the picture at all. And I think he knew it because I didn't, he didn't hear me laugh. But I tried to laugh, but it wasn't, wasn't funny. 
And now I was collecting unemployment insurance at that time in New York. And there was a scene where Doris Day goes to get some unemployment insurance. And it, it wasn't the way they did it in L.A. I mean, in New York. It wasn't the way they did it in New York. Maybe that's the way they did it in L.A., but I, I made them a terrible mistake. When you see a movie, just a friend invites you to see a movie, don't criticize anything. Just, it was wonderful. Because if you say anything at all, it'll be taken that you hated the movie. So I said, you know, I've been getting unemployment insurance, and that's not quite the way it works. Carrie got furious. Oh, yes, that's exactly the way it is. We researched that very carefully. That's exactly the way it's done. And I said, well, it's, it's not important. He said, well, it, it, it is important, but it's exactly the way it's done. We researched that very carefully. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed the picture. And we walked away, and he said, uh, yelling after me, we researched that very carefully. <laughs> I said, oh, shit. So I went back to New York. And then he, then he came to New York, and I called him. And his opening line was to me, You didn't like my picture. <laughs> yes, I did. No, you didn't. You didn't like my picture. That's all right. It made a lot of money. But it wasn't my favorite. No, you didn't like it. That's all right. <laughs> he was right. I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Proving that you can be Cary Grant at, at the, well, I guess, beyond the pinnacle of his career and still be a, a, as incredibly fragile an ego as... Yeah, how about that? Yeah. Yeah, he produced it. But again, I get the sense that these were, you know, these were people who, sure, he was still, he was still a star. He was, he was on, his star was on the wane. But you're knocking on the doors of these people when everyone else has kind of forgotten that they're there and that you're, you're looking for information. You're looking for not just anecdotes, but really their whole life experience. And that's what you're, you know, that that, that was, I think, really kind of revolutionary in terms of who you were as a, a journalist and a aspiring uh, filmmaker. I think. You know, it's flattering when somebody's seen all your pictures. If somebody comes up to me now and says, I love, I love all your pictures, and I say, which ones? And they mention three or four. They say, okay, that's pretty good. You know what I mean? It's, it's very flattering. So when I knew all of Ford's movies, all of Hawks' movies, could talk about them, you know, I didn't have to have notes. I mean, I had notes, but I didn't, I didn't have to, you know what I mean? I knew the pictures. That was just flattering to them as well. I have to, the, the revenge is here. The revenge is back. <laughs> Where is that bathroom? That was the end of part two of my conversation with Peter Bogdanovich. If you enjoyed listening to Movies Till Dawn, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at movies till dawn podcast at gmail.com. You can access these conversations at iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, YouTube, as well as our website, moviestilldawn.transistor.fm. If you'd like to see some videos pertaining to the guests of each episode, please visit my blog at moviestilldawn.blogspot.com. And please feel free to follow me on Twitter at RealRDEF. That's R-E-E-L-R-D-E-F. All interview material and audio clips are covered by the Fair Use Copyright Act of 1976, in which allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. Music